Go ahead and take your Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And I'm going to read verses 14 through 18 to kick this off. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14 says, Let all your things be done with charity. I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that ye submit yourselves unto such, and to every one that helpeth with us and laboreth. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaeus, uh, for that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. Right here we see a couple people that were mentioned that Paul makes special note of, and one of them was Stephanus. And Stephanus, he was, he mentions him as being the first fruits of Achaia. Basically, what he's saying is this is what he was the first one that I won to the Lord when I was there. He was the one, he was the first one that I got. And if you go back in chapter 1 and verse 16. Paul mentions baptizing him. He says uh, there was like a you know conflict going on. People were saying some I'm of Paul, others I am of Apollos, and Paul was getting on them for that. And he, they were you know basically trying to put themselves into different groups based on who they were baptized by. But he says, and I baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beside, I know not whether I baptized any other. He's saying the only ones I even know I baptized was Stephanus, probably because he was the first fruits. He was the first one that they got in Achaia, if I'm saying that right. And these guys were people, he says, they addicted themselves to the ministry. Now, we use the word addicted a lot in America today. We got a lot of addicts, don't we? But uh, the word addicted uh, that's used here, it's not the same meaning necessarily today, but it's talking about somebody who's just you know, devoted to by customary practice and basically these another definition it's like these guys that addicted themselves to the ministry they devoted themselves to it and they basically kind of appointed themselves to it was another definition these guys they saw a need for something and they wanted to minister to the saints and these guys just got devoted to it and they that's what it means when they addicted themselves to it they became devoted they volunteered for it they just jumped into this and I want to talk to you this morning about getting involved in the ministry. We see here, it mentions the ministry of the saints that these guys got involved in. And a lot of times when people think about, you know, going into the ministry, they think about something like, you know, pastoring or being a missionary. They think of some type of full-time position. But I'm going to tell you right now that that's, you know, you don't have to be full-time in the ministry to be in the ministry. There are a lot of ministry things that can be done that are helps like you will not believe we see Paul here talking about these guys and man these people they were an encouragement they were refreshing to him and many of the great people that you see in the Bible that are mentioned quite a bit a lot of times you'll see other people in there that maybe aren't mentioned as much but we see Paul he's always in his writings especially at the end he's always naming off all these different people just people we have no idea who they are, but they were people that helped in the ministry, people that were involved, and people that you can tell Paul greatly loved these people. And he points out Stephanus, who was the first fruits. He was one of the first ones. And I guess when I was thinking about this passage, I think of all of you in here today as kind of the first fruits of Liberty Baptist Church. We are still in the early days here in this church, but I believe that we are fast approaching getting to the next level, I guess you could say. I really believe that the Lord is going to expand what we do here in a great way. I believe God wants to do great things. I don't know if you all have noticed, but there's a lot of lost people out there in this community that need to get saved. There's a lot of, there's a lot of needs. This area, it's not going in the right direction. There is a, there's a lot of problems around here. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And not just with the lost people, but even amongst saved people, amongst Christian people, even right here in this church, there are needs that we all have and there are ways that we all can minister to each other and be a help. And I just want to challenge you today to get involved in the ministry. And we're going to look at diff some different ministries and what they are. Maybe just, I don't know, I'm going to throw some ideas out there. 
you might get you might have your own ideas you know everybody's got different abilities different talents that God wants to use but I, I, I really do believe that if you're saved you ought to be in the ministry some way or another okay I mean so not everybody's gonna pastor a church or go to a foreign country be a missionary but there is something that everyone can do and you know what I mean many of you you're you're already doing a lot of this and if you are keep it up hey keep it up it's an encouragement like you wouldn't believe it, but may, a lot of times people think what they do is small and it's insignificant and I'm if if that's how you feel I want to tell you that that's not the case what you do makes a difference it matters and we see here in first Corinthians Stephanus uh, that was mentioned he was involved in the ministry of the saints that's what he called it these guys had addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints what does that mean to minister you know the ministry to the saints okay this is a ministry to save people a lot of times when we think about ministries we think about stuff that we do outside the church you know reaching people in the community and let me tell you that is a huge part of it we're going to get into it but these guys here their ministry it was to the saints it was to the believers, to people that were already in the church. These guys, they ministered to them. And basically, to be a minister is just to be a servant. You're somebody that's serving people. These guys, they, they were meeting needs. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the children of Macedonia, how that in a, in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Now, this group that we're looking at here was people that Paul said were in deep poverty. But notice he talks about the riches of their liberality. One of the things you'll see uh, in the Bible when it talks about liber liberality and being liberal, it's talking about in giving. And these guys who were in deep poverty were very liberal in their giving. And it says, for to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. These people, they basically had to beg Paul to take this gift. They're like, please take this gift. I, you know, I've never seen too many evangelists have to get begged to take a gift before, to take an offering. But these people were so poor, Paul's like, man, we, we can't take your offering. They're like, no, please take this offering. Why, what was it for? For the ministering of the saints. To help other poor Christians. People who had actual needs. And you know what? There are, there are needs of people in the church. Now I know, you know, we live in America, and I know as far as here in the church, it doesn't look like any of us are starving too bad. Um, you know, some of us might seem like we're starving the way we're going to eat afterwards. But, you know, we, we're doing okay in the eating part. But yet that doesn't mean that there aren't still needs. Sometimes people, you know, may, you know they're, they get older and they need help with things. And unfortunately, I think too much we depend on the government for everything. When, you know, there was a time when churches and family members and neighbors, they just automatically did these things. But... Somewhere along the lines, we said, you know what, let's let the government do it. And then they said, okay, we'll do it, but you're still going to pay for it. And then we, now we complain our taxes go up all the time. But part of the problem is we've just kind of shirked our responsibility, and we ought to take care of people's physical needs. Well, well what are they? I don't, I don't know what any need anybody has. Yeah, you know why? Because you're not paying attention to anybody else. There are needs that are out there. We've got to pay attention. You know, maybe just ask. There's things that we can do that can be a help. You know, maybe mowing somebody's yard, maybe, you know, cleaning out someone's gutters, things like that, doing it for other believers, ministering to the saints. That's a big help. You know how many people I've talked to, you know, just out visiting or even uh, that just have these little needs that they can't get anybody to do for them. With my job doing estimates, I talked to a lady one time. Part of the reason she was getting water in her basement is she had plants growing out of her gutters and she had a 20 something year old son that was living in her basement and she was just talking about I, I, I can't find anybody to clean these gutters out for me I said well what, what about your son oh he won't do it <laughs> I'm thinking I'd throw him out if he wouldn't do that but you know there's people out there that they have needs you know you can't expect some lady that's in her 70s or 80s to go climb up on the roof and do things like that 
but we've got to pay attention. You ought to find out where people live and you ought to just look around and see what needs to be done. You see somebody struggling in an area, you know, you, you do it. I'm not going to, you know, go pointing stuff out and I don't want to, you know, make people feel bad. You've got to pay attention yourself, see what needs are out there, listen to what people say, and then just help them out. And, you know, there's some of you that do that. There's some of you, even just things like, you know, writing someone a letter, sending somebody a card, visiting somebody, phone calls. You would not believe the blessing you've been to some people just because they've gotten phone calls. I've talked to people that were going through different things that were in the hospital, and they told me, you know, so-and-so gave me a call. And man, it, it just encouraged me so much. You know what you're doing? You're ministering to the saints. Make them feel like they're a part of a family. You know, one of the reasons, I mean, I can't, and I know I'm the pastor here, but I cannot imagine going somewhere else. Okay? You know, I, you know, we, you know, they were talking in Sunday school about, oh, you know, you're glad I'm here and planning on sticking around. But, I mean, I can't imagine. I would feel like I'm abandoning family. You know, I just, I feel like if I did ever go somewhere else, I would hurt many of you. I kind of hope it would. I mean, <laughs> I hope you. I hope you wouldn't be excited. And honestly, uh, you know that uh, that bugs me. I don't. I don't want to do that. I. I'm attached, and I. I want to pay attention. And let me. It ought to be. You ought to feel the same way. You ought to feel like, hey, I, this church needs me. And whether you know it or not, we do need you. They need my help. They need my presence. Just being a minister. Maybe it's just going and just talking. I mean, talking to people. Me and Prince, we were out knocking doors the other day, and you know, a lot. We we went to this one lady's house, and man, she talked to us forever. We got her whole life story, and I'm and you know, we didn't get to hardly do any other visiting because this lady took up all our time. And I, was, you know, I was like, well, at least we were a blessing to her. <laughs> you know, she she just wanted to unload on somebody, and you know, sometimes that's all people need. They need somebody that will listen to them, somebody that will pay attention to their problems. And whenever they give you a problem. You don't go and outdo their problem, okay? I know that's what we're all good at. You know, if somebody's sick, I, I had 102 fever last week. I had 103, you know? You know, we're always trying to do that. We're always worse off than the next person. Hey, let somebody tell you their problems, and you don't need to tell them theirs, okay? Let them feel like they, they're struggling more than anybody else, and you just, you can go tell somebody else your problems, okay? And, you know, minister, okay? And you're going to have to pay attention, you're going you're gonna to have to get over yourself a little bit. And I'm telling you right now, this is one of the best ways that you can help yourself. Many people today are so focused on their own needs and on their own problems, they're blind to what's going on around them. And the truth is, chances are, unless, man, you've really got it bad, unless you're like Job or somebody, there's probably somebody that's struggling more than you are. And when you're noticing what other people go through, a lot of times it causes you to say, you know what, I haven't got it that bad. I mean, we like to complain here in America. I do plenty of complaining. I mean, I complained all over the radio this morning. But you know what? I'm glad I don't live in Syria right now. You all see what's going on over there and in those countries by Syria? I'm glad I don't live there. It can be a lot worse, but boy, we get focused on our own problems and get involved in meeting those needs, physical needs, spiritual needs. You know, pay attention to what's going on. You, you see somebody's having a hard time, man, maybe somebody just needs a hug. You know, just make sure people feel welcome. Make sure they feel loved. Those type of things. Just, you know, meeting those needs. You, somebody, you see somebody's doing without something. There's something that they don't have that they need. And you have it. You know, it's amazing the things that we just have lying around our house that we could care less about that could be a huge blessing to somebody else. But many times we don't pay attention to those things. You know, we don't know, we don't have any idea about any needs that anybody else has, and we miss out on opportunities to be a great blessing because we're so focused on ourselves. But these guys, they got devoted to the ministry of the saints, and we don't know what, it, what all it was they did. But these guys, uh, whatever they were doing, it encouraged the Apostle Paul. It inspired him. It inspired others. And it's amazing some of the ministries that people have just, they've literally made up. Just little things that they've come up with themselves, needs that they saw, ways they were able to be a help. They were a huge blessing to people. And, you know, God's given you those talents you have for a reason. He wants you to use them, and he wants you to use them in the church to minister to the saints, meet those physical needs, meet the spiritual needs. But then also go to Acts chapter 6. 
Acts chapter 6, and that this might not be for everybody, but it may be for some of you in here. Acts chapter 6, verse 1 says, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. As the church grew, okay, and as our church grows, the needs of people are going to grow. Okay, the church is multiplying rapidly, and there were widows in the church. There were people that needed help. And the apostles, they're looking at all that's going on. They're looking at these needs that are out there. And they're like, you know, we can't meet all these people's needs and at the same time study the word like we're supposed to do, you know, minister to people in the word. And so they went and they got men that ended up being, becoming deacons that basically were just servants in the church that did those the ministry of the saints. And then these guys focused on the ministry of the word. And the ministry of the word is basically just the teaching of the word of God. Do you know why you know, America's going the way it's going today? It's because people have no clue what the scripture says about anything. Do you know why churches are going in the crazy directions that they're going? The people in the churches have no idea what the Bible says about anything. The reason families are, don't know how to raise their kids, they don't know what the Bible says in these areas. They don't, they've, they've not studied it. Nobody's taught them. Nobody's helped them. And there needs to be people in the church that that's their focus is the ministry of the word. They need to be in the scriptures and they need to be teaching people the scriptures. You know, it's not enough it, it doesn't work. There are some preachers that are really good at getting up and telling you what you should do, but not showing you why from the scriptures. And I can get up here and I can yell and scream all I want about what I think you ought to do, but it's probably not going to work unless I show you in the scripture. And some of the stuff that the scripture says to do, it's not real pleasant. It goes against our flesh. And so, uh, you know, we've got to be able to find those scriptures. And, be, and some of the, there's some things in the Bible that, you know, they do. It takes some study. It takes a little bit of work. And we do. We need, we need teachers in the church. We need people that are students of the Word of God, that know how to communicate these things to other people. Have you, have you ever known what the right thing was to do, but you didn't always know how to maybe communicate it to the next person? And there's a lot of people that are like that. They know what's right. They're doing what's right. But they're maybe teaching is just not their gift. But then there's other people. Boy, God's blessed them with that. They know how to communicate it on to the next person. And that is huge in a church. And as the church grows, we're going to have more and more people coming from more and more different walks of life with, that are facing different things. And we need people that can teach them you know, what to do. You know, I can't answer every question, you know, on S Sunday when I get up here and preach in church that people have. People are going to be asking questions. There's things they're going to want to know. And we need people that will ministry in the word, minister to people in the word. Part of the, the purpose of ministering to people in the word, we need to strengthen their faith. You know, one of the things that I've, that is the most rewarding thing to me in, in preaching the gospel is some of the things that, messages I've preached in the past that, you know, in areas and subjects that aren't just aren't real popular today. And there's people that they knew, you know, they, they, they talked to me after the service and they, they knew they were right and maybe how they felt about certain sins. But, you know, the world's telling if you feel that way, you know, you're terrible, you're wrong, you're judgmental. And when you can show them from the scriptures, hey, you're right in how you feel. I mean, and you just, you see them get it, and now they know what the scripture says, and that confidence it brings. That's one of the most rewarding things, because you know, you just strengthen their faith. Their faith's a little stronger. You know, there's many of you here, you know, you're saved, you, you know, you know you're saved, but you know, when we, when I preach messages about salvation, it just, I don't know, gives you even more confidence. And that's what we need. We need our faith strengthened, and you can do that by teaching the word to other people, by ministering to people in the word, encouraging them 
in the Lord. You know, taking the promises of the Bible and giving them to people and sharing them, giving them, and then especially giving them something that they can pass on to someone else. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2 says, uh, the things that thou hast learned, let me find out, I'm not going to quote it right if I just try to say it to you, but the things that thou hast learned among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. One of the things that really makes people give up a lot of times is when they'll go to church and maybe they'll hear preaching in a certain area and they'll start changing their life in different areas and then of course they meet the opposition on the outside their friends criticize them maybe even their family criticizes them for what they're doing and a lot of times those people the only answer they have for why they're doing what they do well my church teaches this my pastor says this well that's not a good argument because you know why their church probably says something else and their pastor probably says something else. But when you give that person you know, the ability to take the Bible and say, hey, the Bible says this, well, you just, you just totally trounce that other person. <laughs> I mean, who, I mean who's, who are they to argue against the Word of God? And that's always my goal. I, I want to tell you all what to do, and I want you all to know what to do, but I want you to also be able to go to the Scriptures. If you just say, my pastor says... You're going to lose the argument every time, and you're going to get discouraged if you just do things because I tell you eventually you're going to quit because somebody else is going to tell you something different. But if I can show you how to find it in the Word of God, then we're going to be in the same side for a long time. And so that, that's always my goal. And so ministering to people in the Word of God, giving them something they can pass on to someone else. It's, you know, when I tell somebody how to be saved, and they pray that sinner's prayer. I believe they get saved, but then I want to, it's important that we teach them how to tell other people. You know, because they say, hey, man, I got saved. How'd you get saved? Well, you know, I asked Jesus into my heart. Well, you, you think that's all it takes? Well, man, now you're supposed to get baptized. You're supposed to speak in tongues. You're supposed to take communion. You're supposed to do all these things. If you, oh, really? The guy told me I was saved. You know, hey, he needs some teaching, doesn't he? He needs to be, you know, they need to be able to eventually show some, hey, no, look, the Bible, the Bible doesn't say anything about that. You know, the Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. And boy, when you can show somebody what it says in the Bible, man, that packs a punch. That packs a punch. And I'm telling you right now, we need to, we need people that can help others do that. Minister to people in the Word of God. It is a powerful, powerful thing. And then in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, says, For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, wait, that's, uh, that's chapter 19. I don't remember talking about Demetrius. It says, But none of these things move me, neither count on my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. The ministry of the gospel. This is something all of us should be involved in some way, shape, or form. But just give, that's giving the gospel to those who've never heard. I mean, we need to be sharing the ministry of the gospel. Now, that's what we do outside the church. Now, we preach the gospel here pretty regularly on, on, you know, during a church service. But I believe most proclaiming of the gospel needs to be done outside the church most of the time it saved people in here but outside man that world is just full of lost people and we've got to minister to them with the gospel we got to find a way to get the gospel to them whether it's passing out a track whether it's you just go going through the plan of salvation with or sometimes people come up with creative ways to give the gospel i mean whatever it is i mean hey i'm not going to criticize your way of giving somebody the gospel as long as you're giving somebody the gospel. I mean, you know, find a creative way to do it. I, I've heard of some, you know, things that people done. I've seen, uh, you know, people, they'll do things just with pictures and stuff. You know, they'll kind of go, go through the plan of salvation just by pictures. Or, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of different ways that you can do it. But, man, just share the gospel with somebody. Tell people about Jesus Christ. You know, talk to somebody. You know, when you, you, you get an opportunity that comes up. Hey, you know, you see these crosses all over the place. You know, what, you know what a cross means? You know what that's all about? I mean, look for openings. Look for opportunities. I mean, people are using Jesus' name all the time. You hear somebody use his name. And like, hey, 
in a nice way. Don't, don't rebuke him, but hey, do you know Jesus Christ? <laughs> I heard you just yelling his name. <laughs> you know, hey, oh, you don't, well, let me tell you about this guy that you're talking about because we're, we're real close. <laughs> you know, I mean, just look for opportunities to minister to somebody with the gospel, soul winning. You know, the work of, of an evangelist. Paul, uh, you know, he said, he told Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13, it talks about the different things that God gave. You know, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and pastors and teachers. You know, and there's all these things he gave. And he wants us to do that work, to evangelize, to be, tell people about Jesus Christ, to tell them about the gospel. And here's the thing too, folks, and I know this you're not supposed to do this, but part of the gospel, part of giving out the good news is you've got to give the bad news. And the bad news is, is that we're sinners and that we deserve to go to hell. People are trying to give the good news without giving the bad news. And they've, they've got to know the bad news, but it's like we're not supposed to talk about sin. We're not supposed to tell people, you know, they're on their way to hell. But listen, that's what you have to do. You've got to give them the bad news before you can give them the good news. And Jesus Christ is the way. I mean, all these things, they're done outside the church. That's why, you know, nursing home ministries are good opportunities. You know, jail ministries, I mean, a captive audience. And, you know, thank the Lord for that. Uh, you, know, pri you know, prison ministries, what, whatever it is. You know, I, I really don't care. As long as you're doing something to share the gospel. I knew some people, they had a ministry, the, the way their ministry, they would travel all over the country and they would stop at random rest areas and pass out tracts. Now, you might think, well, that's kind of a waste of time. Hey, at least they were doing something. At least they were trying to give the gospel to somebody and just do something to get the gospel out. Spread it. That is the ministry of the gospel, and we ought to be involved in that. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to end with this one here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm not naming everything that there is. There are so many different ministries and and I've said this before and I'll say it again. If you think of it, if you see something that like, you know, I think the church needs this, you're probably the one that God wants to do that. That's why you noticed it. That's why, you know, he showed you. So, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, this is what we need in the church. Pastor, this is what you need to start doing. You know, if you think of it, you should do it. Okay? So just, just remember that. Uh, don't, I, I could come up with all kinds of ideas for the rest of you. So... Um, if you all come up with an idea for me, I'm going to give an idea for you. So just remember that. <laughs> and, and I got a lot of good ones. But anyway, uh, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now this one, this, this is an exciting ministry right here. When you see someone get saved, and you know maybe somebody that's saved out of a, just a wicked life of sin. I mean, it's amazing the people that God saves. The people that he wants to save. People we would think, you know, why even bother saving them? People that most churches wouldn't even want them in their church. Listen, God can save them. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. God can change that person's life in a great way. And there is that ministry of reconciliation. When someone gets saved, especially if they get saved out of a life of sin, you know, last week we talked about how when someone gets saved, their flesh still isn't saved. Their flesh still wants to sin. And those people, if they're going to get victory over the flesh, they need people to help them with that ministry of reconciliation. Help them to get their life back on the right path. And then verse uh, 19, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Boy, there is just something about someone who's lived a wicked life, done all kinds of horrible things, and they are able, when they are able to come into a church, and the people in that church don't hold it against them. Maybe they've got a criminal record. They can go try to get a job anywhere, and it gets brought up all the time. They're constantly getting brought up. No, we can't hire you. You've got the criminal record. You've got these felonies or whatever. You know, maybe their family brings it up. Their friends bring it up. But, boy, they ought to be able to come to church. And when a person gets saved, we, minister, we do that ministry of reconciliation with them. We don't bring that stuff up. And that was before you were saved. You're a new creature now. You're saved now. In verse 21, For he hath made him 
to be sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus Christ paid for your sin. It's under the blood. You're not going to pay for it here. We're not going to make you a second class citizen here at the church because of something in your past. Jesus Christ saved you and you are joint heirs with Christ now. And it says for that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let's just start trying to be like Christ and let's help these people start being like Christ. And then in chapter 6, we then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in an accepted time, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. And behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessity, in distresses. We see here... That we, I mean, these, it, it's going to take some patience. It's going to take some work. We're going to have people that are going to come, and they're going to, they're going to come with some baggage. But you know what? We're going to do that ministry of reconciliation. We're going to work with them. We're going to have patience with them. We're, just, we're going to love those people. And I'm telling you right now, that is one of the most exciting things when you just start seeing those new converts. You start seeing them learn. You see them changing their life. You see them getting victory uh, you know, over the sins in their life. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, and it says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for he hath counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And this is Paul talking here. And listen to what he says. He's, I'm just thankful to be in the ministry. I'm thankful to be here today who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly, and unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ came, Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. For a pattern to them, which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul, he just he looked at his life and he looked at his ministry and he was just like, I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe that God has counted me faithful and he put me in the ministry. You know what I used to do? I used to be a blasphemer. I used to be all these things and here I am, an apostle, a minister of the gospel. And man, that is the most exciting thing in the world when you see... God takes somebody, maybe a life of drugs and alcohol and misery, and you see them get saved and God change their life. But listen, it's not enough for us to just go tell them how to get saved. We need to do that ministry of reconciliation. We've got to work with them. We've got to disciple with them. We've got to put up with them. We've got to have patience. They might come for a while, and it might take them a few weeks or a few months before they learn to start showering regularly. You know, it might take them maybe even a year or so before they start you know, looking like a Christian. I mean, there's, there's some scary people that sometimes come into church. Even after they get saved, they still look kind of scary. You know, it might take them a while to get over some of their bad habits, but you'll work with them and you'll love them, and you never know one of these days they could be up here preaching the gospel. And that is one of the most amazing things about what we do. And the Apostle Paul, he was like, I'm, I'm a great example of that. That's one of the reasons God saved me to show others that he can save anybody. I am the chief of sinners, and God has put me in the ministry. But you know, even with Paul, I believe huge credit should go to a man named Barnabas. Barnabas, who is known as the son of consolation. After Paul got saved... In Acts 9.26, and when Saul, you still called Saul, was come to Jerusalem, he is saved to join himself to the disciples. I mean, I'm saved now. I'm going to go join up with the disciples. I'm going to go join up with the Christians. But you know what? The disciples, they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Saul? He, no, 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 no. That guy, he's the one that's been persecuting us. We've been running from that guy. There's no way he is really saved. You know what? This is probably a cover. He's coming in undercover, and he's going he's gonna to find out what we're doing. He's going to get all our names. He's going to kill all our families. And you know what? They didn't want him amongst them. But you know what? Verse 27, but Barnabas took him. Barnabas, he was always encouraging people. You always see Barnabas encouraging people. There's another story where Barnabas and Paul separated because Barnabas' nephew, uh, Mark, I believe it was, John Mark, uh, he had left them. And Paul, when they were in the ministry somewhere, and he wanted to come back, and Paul didn't want him. And Barnabas said, no, he's, he's right, I want him. And they ended up 
disputing that with each other. They separated. But you know what? Later on, we see Paul, he, in one of his letters, he asked for him. He said, send him, for he's profitable to me. You know, and I wonder if Mark, maybe he stayed in because of guys like Barnabas that just encouraged him. And Barnabas, he comes along to the disciples and like, hey, guys, we, no, this is, hey, he's changed God saved his soul. He's one of us now. And Barnabas got the disciples to accept him. And you know what? What if there wouldn't have been a Barnabas to encourage Paul like that? Maybe Paul would have, wouldn't have done the things that he did. But, Bar but Paul ended up doing great things because there was people like Barnabas. And you know what? I hope this never happens around here. I mean, I really do. I love all of you in here. But if you ever do this to anybody, man, I hope... I hope you go to church somewhere else. But if somebody, you know, they come and they get saved, all right, and they, I hope you'll accept them and love them and don't look down on them because they're not everything you think you, you think they ought to be. Maybe they don't grow as fast as you think they ought to grow. I hope you'll have patience and love them. We don't want to go scaring off any Saul of Tarsuses. We want to win those people. We can still do that today, but we've got to have that ministry of reconciliation. And when that person comes along, man, you need you ought to get involved in that. Just love on them. Accept them. I mean, they make them a part, feel like they are a part of the family. Invite them over to your house. What if they steal something? The Lord will repay it. <laughs> the Lord will take care of it. You know, what, you know, don't worry about that. Man, we're just, we can really become like Pharisees quite a bit, can't we? You know, even the Apostle Paul, who was the one that got accepted there later, he was. He kind of rejected Mark, didn't he? But later on, he kind of got it right. It's, it can happen to any of us. We can all kind of become the Pharisee. But there, listen, there's people out there that they do. They just need someone to love them. They need people to love them. They need God's people to accept them and to perform that ministry of reconciliation. Bring them, get them closer to God. Work with them. Love them. Have patience. And... I mean, it's amazing the little things that we can do that make the biggest difference. You know, just sometimes learning a person's name, I've impressed people because I remember their name. That's like, got lucky on that one because I stink at that. <laughs> but, I mean, just the fact that you paid attention to them, you cared about them, maybe you remember their birthday or something like that, those things are huge. And you have an opportunity here, when you're a part of a church, I mean, you are surrounded by people that need minister to. They're saints, and you ought to get involved in that. Take advantage of it. It's the best way to get your eyes off your own problems, and it'll, it'll help you have victory in your own life by doing that. And we need it. Our world needs it. We need to minister to them the, go the gospel to them. We need to have that ministry of reconciliation. And if you're not involved in it, I hope you'll get involved in it. If we're going to take this to the next level here at Liberty Baptist Church, we need all of you to get in the ministry. I hope you'll do that. So let's all stand together right now.